Okay, a uh, very warm welcome, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to call it the very good uh, morning, noon, afternoon, evening. And for some of us, I know it's uh, maybe a midnight. Uh, this is a group, uh, SC Impact Group, a global expert network, uh, which is presenting this webinar. And one of the things that I would like to say about this group is that uh, this is the group on which sun never sets. Uh, so we have, we have a very, uh, I think, a good galaxy of speakers today. And the topic is also very important. Uh, we all hear about the sustainability, ESG, and uh, the topic is the how to disclose human capital uh, in the ESG reporting by using ISO 30414 guidelines for internal and external human capital reporting standards. Most of the members of this group are, are the, uh, I think, called the co-authors of this standard, and uh, this uh, webinar is also going to is going as, uh, as a live streaming on the YouTube channel of one of our, our member. And uh, uh, we are going to have the different threads about this conversation today. And uh, this includes uh, a brief introduction about the uh, this uh, special uh, group and uh, how this mission that we are chasing is a link with the overall uh, mission of the planet, that the sustainability. And then the uh, almost 15 different members, they're going to talk about the different threads, including the uh, components of the disclosure, how does it re really impact the organization, how it can impact the uh, different stakeholders, uh, what are the uh, different uh, important modalities in terms of the difference or the terminologies that those are being used in the standards, and uh, uh, most importantly, what's the purpose, why we are doing it, and what difference is going to make to the organizations. And uh, uh, the experts are going to talk, share their experience uh, with also a focus on the relevant market. What is happening in the different parts of the world? Uh, you know, what organization have got certified on this standard? And uh, toward the end, we are going to have some, uh, you know, uh, spotlight on what's coming ahead because the members of this group are also part of the ISO technical committee on the uh, TC260. Uh, so in that context, I think... Uh, it's important to you know keep a tab on uh, the different things which are currently uh, in the process of evolution. So without taking uh, more time, I would like to uh, request uh, uh, Hilger Pothman, who is basically who is basically a, a driver behind the behind the entire process, and uh, he is uh, managing this also this group, Human Capital Impact Global Expert Network Group, and uh, I also. Uh, 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 I'm supporting him in this uh, webinar. Hilger uh, began his professional career in 1985 with the Deutsche Bank in uh, Germany. Between the 2008 and 2024, he was responsible for as a regional head of HR and business partner, covering a large part of the German region of the Deutsche Bank Group. Currently, he is leading his uh, their transformation enablement group in the Germany. Besides being a founding member of the, uh, you know, Goenger Kress uh, in 2004, Hilger has been a voting member of the Society for Human Resource Management uh, in 2010-11, supporting the development of the USHR standard. In this context, he is also uh, an initiator and founding member of the German DIN Mirror Committee of ISO TC260, which is responsible for developing the global HR standards with a specific focus on orchestrating guidelines for the human capital reporting, which result into ISO 30414 as a product. Hilger continues to be a passionate advocate and a driver toward the implementing ISO 30414, hence establishing a benchmark around the human capital intangible for all the stakeholders. And uh, uh, Hilger also has the honor of uh, belonging to a company which uh, happens to be a second uh, uh, you know, ISO 30414 certified company on this planet, the Deutsche Bank. Uh, so Hilger is going to talk about the, you know, overall mission, uh, what is the uh, overall driver for this group and uh, the composition of the group. So Hilger, over to you. And uh, I, I, I can stop sharing my slides, or if you want me, I can just give me uh, next and I'll move on the slides, whatever you prefer. Um, <clears throat> well, um, thank you, Sahid. Um, maybe you can show the expert uh, world map um, so people can see um, how large uh, the distribution of the group is. Maybe that would be helpful, wonderful. 
So first of all, thank you, Sahid, um, for organizing this impressive event and for your nice words. Um, you shouldn't have read that. Um, it feels me, makes me, um, uh, you know, red in my face. Um, I'm personally very proud that we see so many highly valued, true human capital experts on this call as speakers. And I must emphasize, I've seen a few names also as uh, participants. Um, human capital impact. Well, you know, nomen est omen, as the French say, um, or other languages. Um, we are simply a group of 25 experts as of today, and we share one single mission. Human capital is considered equally relevant as financial capital. We need to get this in the heads of all CEOs, of all politicians, of all talents, and um, of all regulators. That's our mission. E human capital is considered equally relevant as financial capital. Now think about the reality where we all come from and think what will change in the next years and decades with human work in the human capital market place. So for investors, for talent, and for governments, that is relevant, and certainly for us as um, human capital professionals. Some of us have been working on this mission for decades. You know, we are in frequent um, or infrequent um, uh, conversations and exchanges with uh, Dr. Jack Fitzens, Dave Ulrich, and other very, very senior um, HR experts. Um, and um, they're very proud that this um, group, but specifically that ISO has ultimately um, produced and, um, and coordinated this um, standard called 30414. Um, As a group, we started to meet and grow after the completion um, and the delivery of ISO 30414, and that was um, back uh, in uh, 2019. Beginning of 2019, we came together. Many of us, uh, we met during those years um, of the uh, standardization work at ISO and in all of these different country level mirror committees and others joined um, our group over the past five years and the latest one um, dr christina follertoon she joined from a large insurance company yesterday so the number 25 uh, was completed yesterday um, so this is a wealth of knowledge and experience i don't know if we were to count the years of experience in the field of human capital markets of alone these 25 um, experts plus the ones that are participating today, it would be an impressive number of years um, that are sitting all together on this live stream and in this meeting. So back to you, Sahid. Thanks for the opportunity and getting this whole thing organized. Super. Thanks for the uh, wonderful start, Hilda. And uh, with this, uh, we move to our next speaker. In fact, ladies and gentlemen, we have kept a very uh, small, uh, you know, amount of uh, the the, uh, the volume of the, you know, talk for every speaker, just to make sure that uh, uh, it's not an uh, overload uh, for any of the audience, because uh, we have almost 15 speakers and like five to seven minutes on an average, everyone is going to talk. And uh, we, but definitely would like to cover the different aspects of these three zero four one four, which are essentially important to uh, you know to comprehend and also to implement the standards. So our next speaker is Jeff Higgin, a leading expert with thirty years experience in the people analytics and workforce planning, and original architect of the ISO three zero four one four, advisor to institutional investors, and an adjunct professor at uni HR of HR and people analytics at University of Southern California. A formal CFO and CHRO, Jeff and his HCMI team are trusted by clients around the world for the smarter data-driven decisions that quantify workforce ROI. So he's a professor of uh, the at Analytics University of the Southern California, Marshall School of Business, co-founder Human Capital Investment and Reporting Council, member of the ISOTC 260 since 2011, Architect of ISO 30414, advisor to the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission on the Human Capital Standards in the United States, and 100% um, ISO 30414 compliant human capital soft, uh, software by the name of SOL that he presents to the market. So over to you, Hill, uh, Jeff. Yes. 
Uh, thank you so much, Zaid. It is a, an honor and a pleasure to be here with uh, so many people that I've known for so many years. Uh, and all of us are passionate about uh, human capital around ESG, uh, measurement, reporting, and perhaps most importantly, disclosure. Um, bad things happen in a dark room, and it's really long overdue for organizations to disclose more information about their most critical asset, human capital people. Um, so what are the drivers behind all of this? Well, uh, Hilger, my uh, esteemed colleague Hilger touched on this a little bit with the increasing emergence and importance of ESG or environmental, social and governance uh, areas and issues. Environment, environmental issues have really grown in importance and are uh, increasingly well measured, reported and disclosed. But social and governance aspects, in particular, human capital uh, is still lagging behind in much of the world. Um, and that was one of the drivers of the original creation of the ISO standard 30414. Uh, so a lot of these, I'm just going to touch on some of these bullet points very quickly. Uh, again, the idea is just to speak for a few minutes, and then I'm going to hand it over to another of my esteemed colleagues, Salon Shiraz. Um, so human capital is increasingly being recognized as one of the most important drivers of competitiveness, value creation, sustainable competitive advantage in a highly volatile environment where uh, technology uh, uh, environment, environment itself uh, is, is changing rapidly. Um, so HR and human capital is pivotal to every organization's success. In fact, it is, it again, is the probably the most valuable asset. And yet that seems in contradiction with the fact that much of the most important information about talent, people, human capital, if you will, is not disclosed. So beyond traditional metrics, uh, crucial intangible aspects around, let's, for example, employee engagement, culture, leadership effectiveness, leadership trust, measuring these elements in addition to things like your cost of your workforce, uh, how many people you have, how much training you invest, and many other aspects, including including diversity, health and safety, compliance, are all critical uh, and, and offer tremendous value to investors who increasingly recognize and actually include that value in some of their investment decisions. So companies are under pressure, increasing pressure from investors, government agencies, regulators, customers, employees, communities to be more transparent. And uh, to be to be uh, fair, many organizations are voluntarily disclosing more information. One way they can do that is by complying with the ISO 30414 standard, or even they can get certified on ISO 30414, which is a great way from both an, an offensive and defensive perspective to uh, show their compliance, show their transparency, and uh, minimize risk for their organization because they're able to uh, point at this global standard, which is the ISO 30414, uh, as the metric set of metrics and standards they are using as their guiding light. So you can see a lot of the reasons why organizations, you know, may want to comply with standards. So from an overall perspective and then a company perspective, you can see it's a great way to minimize risk, improve operating efficiency, support market expansion, environmental impact, and your own uh, meet your own ESG goals, uh, and also to improve improve business insights and better business outcomes. So uh, let, let's go to the next page. Thank you. Um, so from a time perspective, I could probably talk for an hour on this, but we're going to make it just one to two minutes here. Uh, this is an updated version of a slide that was originally created and cited uh, by the uh, conference board uh, in some research that actually a couple of other members who are speaking, including Solange Saras, um, uh, helped put together in some research. Now, I've updated it by adding a new, a new organization to it. Um, but you can you can essentially see that uh, oh actually that's the old version so uh, apologies uh, the new version will be included a new version actually includes the new CSRD uh, ESR EFRS uh, S1 
uh, which is uh, was approved in the EU, European Union, for human capital reporting disclosure. And many European countries are actually scrambling to comply with that beginning in 2025, 20, actually 2024 and 2025, uh, with additional uh, phased in uh, requirements being included. Uh, if you look at this and you just look at the colors, you can see that the quantitative versus qualitative versus both quantitative and qualitative uh, kind of really show that from an uh, the third column, uh, which is ISO, really reflects ISO 30414, which is, uh, in fact, uh, the most quantitative of the other standards with, you know, simply simply said, it's the most blue of all of the different uh, standard setting bodies and frameworks out there. There are many other good frameworks that are being used. Most of them are heavily, re heavily required or heavily uh, focusing on uh, compliance from a qualitative and discussion standpoint as opposed to a pure quantitative standpoint. So it still leaves organizations and companies that want to follow these uh, these other networks and other uh, standard setting body formats to the ability to talk about it, but not show anything specific. In other words, they can say they love their people and treat them well and everyone's highly engaged, but they don't have to report their uh, employee engagement score. So that's uh, that's the idea, the point, the value of disclosure and measurement is what gets measured gets managed and what gets disclosed uh, in all likelihood is going to get more focus and improvement. Uh, with that, I'd like to turn it over to uh, my next colleague, uh, Salon Shiraz. Super. Thanks, Jeff, uh, for giving us a wider perspective uh, in terms of coverage of the important aspects of the disclosure by the different uh, standards and the standard setting body. Okay, so our next speaker is uh, Dr. Sharas. Uh, she's the founder and the CEO of the HC Moneyball and a professor of practice at Columbia University. Uh, Dr. Sharas' work is focused on identifying and quantifying the material impact of the human capital on the corporate performance, generating thought leadership for the board directors and the C-suite executive She's an expert in the area of the human capital disclosure required by the ESG governance framework. Uh, as a member of the ISO TC 260, she contributes to the development of the global human capital standards. Uh, Solange is a board director at the Conference Board, uh, World at Work, University of Southern California, and EZRA Coaching. She's a co-author of the Humanizing Human Capital, Invest in Your People for Optimizing Business Returns. I have read this book a wonderful compilation uh, and is currently uh, writing her second book. This one focused on the human capital management in the professional services firm. I also must inform everyone that we are also going to have the round of question answers, but toward the end. So uh, all those speakers who are with us at that time, they'll be happy to respond to any of the questions that the audience may have. So over to you, Dr. Solange. Thank you, Zahid. I am delighted to be here with all of you and be in such good company. Um, for the people who are participating, who are observers, um, this group of speakers, and there are some experts in our team that are unfortunately not participating, but we are really comprising the, what they say, the tip of the spear when it comes to human capital information, human capital compliance, human capital disclosures, and human capital standards. So my question today um, that I'm going to be addressing is what is the S of ESG? The S being the social. And how do we connect what's going on in terms of human capital in an organization and how that supports sustainable financial outcomes for organizations? Next slide, please. Uh, and I'm going to go through these slides pretty quickly. Um, obviously, we're not the only ones that are thinking about S as an issue. Um, I gave, uh, hopefully, Zahid will share these slides with the participants, but there's a hot link to an article called Time to Rethink the S and ESG, which is published in the Harvard Law School Forum on Corporate Governance. And um, you can see that the S is not just about employees, but it's about customers, quality issues, data security, um, supply chain management, um, your relationship with your suppliers and your strategic partners. So the S really covers a lot. Um, but today we're just gonna focus on the human capital part of S. Next slide, please. 
Um, if you take anything away from this presentation that I'm giving today in these, uh, what's left of my, I think, five minutes, how much time do I have left here? Uh, three minutes and 13 seconds, because I'm timing. Um, please focus on this particular slide that really recontextualizes or reframes the impact of human capital as a driver of sustainable economic performance. Um, we've had a fundamental shift and it's not just the practitioners, but it is the uh, stakeholder community. So investors, customers, strategic partners, communities, um, and employees. Um, and this is driven by the investment community um, that where the SEC and most of the uh, financial reporting um, bodies around the world are recognizing that human capital is not simply an investment or a sunk cost where you, you know, invest, you allocate budget and you don't expect anything back from that budget. Um, that's the old orientation. The new orientation is that human capital is actually an investment in an intangible asset, that what we invest in people should actually drive a return on that investment that should support the organization's success. So instead of just saying, oh, I'm allocating $10 to HR and it's a sunk cost and I'll never see that money again, to think about how can I invest $10 in human capital to generate a return on that investment? How can people actually drive human capital or value creation? And now that we have a new orientation, we need a new language. And um, so this new vocabulary um, includes these metrics where we can actually understand at the aggregate level, at the collective level of the organization or at the consolidated level of the organization, this concept of return on investment in human capital. So the first metric is HCROI, human capital return on investment. HCBA is human capital value add. HCII is human capital investment intensity. What percent of your budget, your operating budget goes to people? Productivity everybody's heard about. And then looking at new types of ways to measure efficiency and effectiveness of human capital in the organization. So we could look at things like a revenue expense ratio or productivity ratio or a compensation to productivity ratio. So it's very green, it's very new, it's very, um, it's evolving and it will help us better understand uh, how to leverage or capitalize on our people in a way that drives sustainable performance without burning through or using up like a resource, our people. So next slide, please. Um, intangible assets is not just a throwaway concept. I'm sure many of you have seen this, but according to Ocean Tomo, 90% uh, of the S&P company's market value um, is uh, driven by intangible assets. And if human capital is considered an intangible asset, then we are part of the value creating chain. So if A equals B, if human capital is an intangible asset and B equals C, intangible assets are driving market value, then A equals C, human capital is driving market value. We have to think about a new way of, of quantifying that and capturing that. My time is up, so let me just go through these next couple of slides, really lickety split. Um, one of the things that Jeff talked about was the ESRS S1 standard. Um, when you get the slides, you can click on the video and the uh, article that's that talks about this. Um, and um, it's really the standard that the European um, Reporting Advisory Group, EFRAG, um, with the CSRD uh, is requiring companies report on human capital performance. Um, and as Jeff said, um, that was formalized um, uh, actually last year. Um, this is the first reporting uh, metric, the first reporting cycle for companies, large companies to report in 20, starting in 2025 with smaller mid-sized companies and small companies reporting in the next 12 to 18 months. 
Um, and um, this is where we're gonna see our first insight, our first glimpses into human capital efficiency and effectiveness. Next slide, please. Uh, in the United States, we anticipate that the SEC is going to release some guidelines for comment, hopefully this year. They are asking, or we believe they're asking for four specific data disclosures. The most important being the last one, which is an auditable line item on their income statement that represents their aggregated total human capital costs. So right now, companies um, basically obfuscate, they, sh they hide how much they're spending on human capital by putting it, allocating it to different line items. So this will give us more transparency to understand the relationship between investments in human capital and their ability to drive financial results. Next slide. Um, and I'm gonna just touch on this for a second. Um, materiality is the standard or the guideline or the yardstick that we use to understand um, whether or not we should invest in a company. So um, the uh, guidelines, the, the standard and the reporting guidelines actually now talk about two different types of materiality, financial materiality. So what moves the needle on financial performance and impact materiality, which I think is brilliant because it's not just about how much money do companies make, but what is their social impact in the, in the world? So you'll be seeing more of that. Next slide, please. Oh, I guess I'm done. So um, thank you for letting me go over a couple of minutes. Hope this was informative and um, enlightening. And I hope you'll all feel the same passion that we do about this topic. Thank you thank so you. much, Paran. Uh, so by the way, a quick compliment on your book. While I have been reading the, every chapter of your book, so once I was going through the process, I always have been looking at the hard metrics that you use uh, that basically determine, you know, the measurement part of the, everything that we can do in HR. Wonderful. Thank you. So with this, uh, we can move to our next speaker, uh, uh, Oliver Kothrade. He's currently working as the HR director for the Panasonic Consumer Electronics Europe. Besides his profession, he gave lectures to the students at the University of Nuremberg. Uh, in human resource management. Uh, Oliver is an honorary judge at the Labor and the Social Court in the Amber since 2012. He's also one of the founding members and deputy head of the German DIN Committee HR Management, which is part of the ISO TC 260. He's a strong belief that HR professionals should create tangible value with the clear outcomes in all HR disciplines to overall business strategy and objective. Therefore, transparent and aligned human capital reporting becomes more important. So, Oliver, happy to have your views. Yeah, thank you very much, Zai, for the nice introduction. Also, a warm welcome from my side from Hamburg, which is in the northern part of uh, uh, Germany. And uh, what I would like to explain you in the next couple of slides is uh, regarding what, what is ISO and how has our work to start many years before. So, first of all, regarding ISO. So, ISO stands for International Organization for Standardization. It's an independent, non-governmental international organization, and it was founded in 1947 in Geneva, which is in Switzerland. And the, the overall aim of ISO is uh, to develop published standards to promote global consistency, quality, and uh, competitively across various industry and fields. And what you can see also on the, on the world map below, that in, in, in many countries, maybe most uh, countries uh, of the world. Um, so we have so-called national standard bodies, which in some way are also associated and in strong liaison uh, also with the ISO standard. So it's really a global network. So next, please. Um, and uh, as uh, ISO, what, what they are providing is really a governance uh, structure. And within this structure, the most important pillar are the technical uh, committees. And also what you can see here in the charts below, uh, over 800 technical committees uh, uh, are, are now working um, in, in, in parallel on various uh, uh, topics. And you can also see that more than 25,000 standards has been released so far from, um, from ISO and also from the experts uh, all over the world. 
And I think it's also very important uh, to know here that this kind of work which we are doing in this uh, technical uh, committee, so we are all, all doing this on a voluntary base. So we are not getting any kind of uh, uh, money for this. So this is really what we are doing as uh, experts or let's say it's um, colleagues who are really interesting in developing this kind uh, of uh, guidelines uh, for, for, for the whole world. Um, so therefore it contains not only experts, but also from the industry, from the government, also from academia, like uh, universities, and also other stakeholders who are really interested in setting up these uh, global standards. And what is a standard in, in, let's say, in the short term? So it's really some kind of documentation. So where we are setting up rules, guidelines, or also some kind of specification that outlines the requirement uh, for, it could be in the technical area, it could be for product, it could be for processes, or even for management standards. Next, please. Yeah, and here on this slide, you can see so how our journey um, uh, began. Um, so we, we have started uh, in November 2011 with the first uh, plenary meeting of our technical committee 260 in uh, Washington, USA. And you can also hear the first uh, uh, member uh, countries uh, who joined that meeting in, in Washington. And also what you now can see in the other world map here is that more and more countries also all over the world are now really contributing uh, in the uh, TC 260, where we are working on various doc documents for the uh, human resource uh, management. Next. Yeah, and here I would like to highlight, uh, because today we are speaking about the human resource management uh, guideline for internal and external human uh, capital reporting. So this was really one of the first uh, guidelines uh, we have ratified and, and published uh, back to November 2018. Uh, and currently we are in the process uh, for review and revision for the second uh, edition. And this is now worked by the TC 260 and especially by, uh, by the uh, working group. And here we would also like to adapt the latest uh, developments uh, in the market, in the environment, uh, which also put, let's say, a strong impact uh, on the overall human capital reporting uh, uh, guideline. And uh, as I also highlight here, number four, so I don't want to go in detail regarding these, let's say, very administrative uh, process uh, for concluding a guideline. So currently, we will be soon announce the, the draft international standard for the revised standard on human capital reporting. And this will also come out for public review and committing. So wherever you have an, an, an interest and you would like to learn about uh, the new revised standards, so please also follow the, the ISO uh, pages, or maybe you can also contact uh, one of our colleagues. So if you would like to have uh, more information uh, where we are in the process uh, at the moment, because I think now the really important time uh, will come up where we will receive a lot of review and comments uh, before we are publishing uh, the second uh, edition for this reporting. Yeah, this is all I would like to share with you, really high level, and now back to Zaid. Wonderful. Thank you, uh, Oliver, for giving us the summary. So if in the nutshell, I think what Oliver is talking with that we, I, this standard basically helps us in speaking one common language. And uh, honestly speaking, and toward the start of my career, I have always been thinking uh, the doctor, why the doctor, the engineer, the auditors, the actuaries, they speak common language of the standards. Why cannot HR? So basically, it's that uh, the dream comes true in the form of the uh, overall standards and particularly the ISO 30414, uh, which links everything in the HR with the clear outcomes. So we have now uh, the next speaker, uh, Kian Hao, the founder and the CEO of the Beijing Century My Way Education Technology Incorporation which offers management consulting, corporate training, and people development service. He has over 30 years management experience with the different companies, including Siemens and Walt Disney. Since 2016, as an expert of uh, standardization administration of China, he plays active roles in the ISO TC232, education and learning services, TC260, HR management, TC314, aging societies. ISO TC321 transaction assurance of the e commerce and TCT42 management consulting. He's done MBA from University of California in the USA and BS from 
they are known the University of Technology in the uh, China. So over to you, Kion. Okay, thank you, Zahid, for the uh, brief introduction about my profile. And uh, uh, it's my pleasure to meet uh, so many experts and professionals in HR uh, arena. And uh, uh, my part of the uh, presentation today is talking about the difference uh, between guidelines and requirements, double quote, in the standard. So when you see a standard, you will, you will, by looking at the title, as many times it addressed with uh, guidelines, requirements, all requirements with guidelines. So uh, I'm it's a, so I'm trying to explain to you uh, the main difference between guidelines and the requirements in standards lies in the level of obligation they impose on organizations and the way they should be applied. So let's take a look at the guidelines. Guidelines are advisory in nature and provide recommendations of best practices for achieving a certain outcome or goal. So they offer flexibility in how organizations can implement the suggested practices and allow for variations based on specific circumstances. So compliance with guidelines is typically voluntary and organizations may choose to follow them as part of a, a broader strategy for improving performance or achieving a certain level of quality. So let's look at the requirements. Requirements set specific criteria or rules that organizations must adhere to in order to comply with the standard. So they are perspective and provide clear, measurable expectations for performance, quality, or safety. Organizations that adopt the standard risk requirements must follow them as stated in order to achieve certification or demonstrate compliance. So in short, in summary, well, guidelines offer flexibility and recommendations for achieving best practices. Requirements impose specific rules and criteria that organizations must follow to comply with the standard. So that's my uh, 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 presentation about the difference between guidelines and requirements. And I'd like to take some questions uh, later on if you have any concern about the HR management uh, reporting development in China. I would like to give some uh, uh, information. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jackie. I finished Super. my presentation. Excellent. So this is an important question uh, that the people ask, uh, you know, what's the difference between the guideline and the requirement standards. So this is one of the reasons that uh, the group has decided to consider as part of the overall uh, briefing. Thank you for uh, sharing your insight. Okay. Uh, next is uh, Dr. Sabrina. Uh, Dr. Sabrina Pitt. Uh, she, you know, she is a work health and aging consultant and a director of the work Wiser International with 90 plus peer reviewed publication and certified ISO 30414 lead auditor. She leverages her extensive background to support organization in implementing programs and evaluation that improve aging societies, create sustainable workforce and integrate standards into the practice. She's a chair of the Standards Australia Committee on Aging Societies and head the Australian delegation for ISO 3C314 aging societies, uh, where she led the development of the ISO uh, 2550 on aging workforce. She is invited globally to speak about the aging workforce issues, including in Peru, in Singapore. Currently, she serves on the several TC260, TC314 ISO working groups, including HR metrics, aging inclusive digital economies, and ISO 30414. She's a convener of the TC314 matrix, recognizes the 2022 standards hero by Standards Australia as a board member for not-for-profit organizations. She continues to impact workforce practices and policy through her leadership in standards practice globally. So Dr. Sabrina, over to you. Thank you, Sahid, and thank you, um, Sahid, for organizing um, this global webinar. Um, I'm going to keep it very brief, as some of it has already been mentioned, but I was asked to talk about the purpose of um, ISO 3044 and the scope. So the purpose um, of ISO 3044 is to measure and report human capital um, 
which helps an organization to manage the risks and opportunities of its most valuable assets, as Solange said, its people. So understanding our human capital um, leads to productivity improvements. It also leads to uh, human capital performance understanding and a more sustainable workforce. So the comparison of performance across divisions and industries and locations, et, et cetera, can give um, your organization competitive advantage and improve decision-making within your company. So next slide, please. So the scope, uh, so the scope is, um, so, sorry, I have to move this out of the way, is to consider and make transparent human capital contribution to the organization in order to support an organization's sustainability objectives. Um, so it's applicable to all organizations of any type, size, nature, or complexity of the business, whether this is in public, private, or a voluntary sector, or for example, not-for-profit organizations. So there are also specific um, recommendations that someone else will talk about later for small to um, medium-sized businesses. So it's definitely not only for large businesses, as some people sometimes think. Um, next slide, please. So it's important to know that human capital analysis and reporting requires a collaborative interdisciplinary approach. Like Jeff said, um, the financials play an important role as well. And so by combining qualitative and quantitative analysis, and we focus on measuring factors that are within the organization's control within um, the document. So next slide, please. So ISO 304 and 4 can help your organization um, with the contextual interpretations. So it can help you identify and discuss uh, what matters most to your organization. So you can also use the standard for external reporting by using aggregated H uh, human capital reporting indicators to create and demonstrate the value of your business. Um, for internal reporting, it's incredibly useful uh, to use standardized uh, H human capital metrics to improve operation efficiency and strategic execution and hence your um, organizational decision making. So, and the last thing it can definitely help you with is measuring and evaluating the organization's human capital in both quantitative and qualitative terms. I also wanna uh, conclude with saying that I'm at an AI summit today where there's a lot of talk about data. So I think there is a massive opportunity with the uh, release of the new standards in, uh, in the new year that the AI tools can help us make this um, a much easier process moving forward. Thank you, Saeed, back to you. Brilliant. Uh, thank you, Sabrina, for managing it uh, despite your travel. Uh, we appreciate your participation. Yeah, okay. thank you. Our next speaker is uh, uh, Nick, uh, Nick, uh, Nick Shafford. And uh, Nick has over 50 years of the very uh, work experience, including senior general management and the finance shows. Uh, from 1989 to 2017, he ran his own management consulting and professional development company. Currently, he is officially retired, but still spends uh, time on research and writing. He is the past chair of the Professional Standards Committee of the International Council of Management Consulting Institute and led the development of the competency model for CMC certification in over 50 global CMC institutes. He is also a member of Mensa. Uh, Nick uh, is a member of the working group two, the metric, the working group of ISO TC 260. He believes that human capital is the untapped frontier of the competitive advantage and the value creation, but is poorly understood in the reporting. Thank you, and uh, over to you, Nick. Great, thanks, Sahi. Uh, it's again a pleasure to be with everybody uh, on this group, and uh, it's been a pleasure to actually work with everybody on this group. So uh, there's a lot of work that's gone on behind the scenes here, and uh, I think there's a lot of like minds. So as Say said, I have over 50 years of experience uh, in, in both financial and general management and 30 years in consulting and training. My sort of major uh, interest and my passion is an organizational culture. And as you can see, the subtitle of the book is essentially uh, 
not only the workplace battlefield, but where great talent goes to die. And I'm picking up on uh, uh, both on uh, uh, Solange's comments and on Jeff's comments. Uh, one of the, the problems with lack of disclosure is that organizations go out and spend a lot of money on talent and bring it into the organization. And what we really need to understand is how well are they creating an environment within that organization where the talent can be optimized because people are the greatest asset, as Solange said. But in some cases, they're, they're, they don't have the opportunity to work at their best um, because the organization isn't creating a positive environment and we're seeing high turnover and things like that. So my passion is, as I say, organizational culture. So that leads us to our question, well, how does my work link to ISO 30414? And the answer is what Jeff talked about, which is you need to know what's going on with your people. You know, not people are not only your greatest asset, you spend your largest amount of money typically on people. And as again, Solange said, we need to move from thinking away for as people as a cost to the organization, where we're trying to drive the cost down to people as an investment in the organization. Uh, next slide. Or have I got it? Yeah, I think we're missing a few bits on here. Um, so what are the 11 areas of disclosure in ISO 314? Um, we were talking about this, uh, Sabrina touched on uh, the, the fact that uh, we contain a number of different metrics. And if you look at the standard in section 4.7.1, there's a table, table two, which I don't know if you hit the slide again, Zaid, whether the table will come up. Yes, there we go. Thank you. So table two, um, which is in section 4.7.1, actually demonstrates the specifics that uh, some of the other talkers have been uh, mentioning. Uh, again, we just, uh, Sabrina touched on the fact of organ large organizations, small organizations, internal and external measures, so the human capital areas, the categories, is that left-hand column there, and the metrics come in the second column. So each of the 11 metrics are explained in the following paragraphs in the standard, 4.7.2 through 4.7.12. And uh, very helpfully, I think, there are real-life case study examples shown in the annex to the guideline as well. So not only can you see what the... Uh, the suggested metrics are, you can see examples of both how they're calculated and how they can actually be applied in practice. One other thing to remember, it's not just ISO 30414 that we're talking about here. This is the core document, which contains the main metrics. But in support of these metrics, there are also a number of ISO uh, guidelines, which our, our working groups have been developing which are technical specifications around specific areas of these metrics. So for example, there's a technical specification on how to develop the culture metrics in much more detail. There's a technical spe specification that only just came out uh, a couple of months ago on the, the very topical area of employee engagement metrics. So there are there is a wealth of information, not only in suggested sort of high level metrics, but then how you put these together. Next slide, please. So there are essentially 11 core areas. Let's start with the first one, which is compliance and metrics. There are five metrics suggested in compliance metrics. I'm not gonna go through them all in detail, but this de de deals with some high level things like uh, uh, tracking grievances, discipline issues, disputes, and the results of audits and uh, uh, all related to human capital, obviously. The second one is a group of items around costs, uh, human resources costs. And again, they talk about things like total workforce costs. One of the things Solange touched on is one of the, uh, the SEC uh, things that the US is trying to get a disclosure on is total workforce costs. Because for many organizations, looking at many, many people's annual accounts, you can't even see that information. And to try and assess human capital performance without understanding how much the organization is actually spending on its workforce is, is extremely difficult. 
So not only are some of the regulations moving in that direction, some of them already require this, but this particular ISO guideline uh, does include it and is one of the suggested areas. The third one is obviously a very well-known area, diversity and inclusion, uh, covers key areas, age, gender, disability, many things like that. And again, I, I re-emphasize here that many of these things are very consistent with the emerging requirements that are coming out of various uh, um, governmental bodies and regulatory bodies in terms of greater disclosure uh, underpinning what Jeff was talking about, a lot of the uh, the whole area of ESG metrics around the social area. Uh, the fourth category is in leadership. Leadership here, essentially, we're talking about very important issues like the measuring trust, span of control, and leadership development. Uh, the next one, organizational culture, certainly an area that I was uh, particularly concerned about. Uh, a couple of measures in organizational culture, uh, mainly the area of employee engagement, satisfaction and commitment, as, as well as retention rate, which is another critical area. Uh, the last one on this slide being health, safety and well-being. Again, emphasize that this is, this is very much aligned with and consistent with health and safety reporting that's already required in many jurisdictions. So what we've tried to do is to make sure that there is uh, an accommodation, if you like, of, of the things which are normal practice in many jurisdictions and areas that we're moving towards. Uh, so again, as I say, these are consistent with areas like ISO 45001, which is, uh, which is focused around the health and safety area. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the next one is the whole area of productivity measurements. This very much deals with um, some of the traditional measures of human capital uh, in terms of overall system performance reporting. Uh, obviously, uh, one of the key areas we have touched on, some of the speakers touched on and earlier, is the human capital return on investment. That falls into this particular category as well. The next one is recruitment. This is fairly large. As you can see, there are 14 metrics in this area. Broke down, broken down between recruitment, mobility, and employee turnover. Uh, again, turnover, very consistent with uh, greater transparency of what's going on in the organization. Uh, the next one is skills and capabilities. Obviously, has to do with the total development and training costs of the organization, participation rates, and assessments of workforce competency. Again, absolutely critical if people are driving your value creation, as Solange talked about, we've got to understand how well the organization is doing in terms of uh, developing and retaining the competences it needs to do that. And uh, succession planning being the next one, three metrics in that area, uh, very much ensuring that there's depth for succession across the organization, key to sustainability of the business model, of course, this is critical. And finally, workforce availability. What is the contingent of workforce we've got? Full-time, part-time. Uh, and finally, the last measure in that category is in absenteeism rates. So as you can see, there's a wealth of measurements contained here that, that not only help organizations move towards uh, good practices or leading practices in measurement, but very much aligned with where the world seems to be going from a an oversight and regulatory point of view. Next one, please. Uh, just to reiterate what, again, uh, some of the early speakers have said and what it says in the uh, the chart that I showed, uh, there are suggestions in 30414 for both internal and external reporting. And one thing that was, was so important and remains so important is that there are different needs for large and smaller organizations. So we don't have a one size fits all. We actually suggest in the metrics that certain metrics should be used for both large and small organizations, but certain will be more applicable to larger organizations and smaller ones. Uh, it's very broad. Uh, obviously it covers the core leading practice approach. Um, how ISO works, I think Oliver talked about this, one of the very important things to recognize is these standards are created not only by volunteers, but by people who are doing this work on a day-to-day -day basis. So these are 
not only academics, but practitioners, people working in the HR industry who are at one of the uh, one of the speakers mentioned the uh, the head of the tip of the arrow, the tip of the activity. So hopefully um, these clearly represent uh, where the world is going. Sorry, I lost. <laughs> Thank Buddy. you. Um, obviously, doesn't need to be said, I don't think, that the metrics in here need to be ultimately determined by each organization's own strategy. But given that HR is such a critical part of strategy, there obviously not needs to be not only strategic planning for HR management, but the metrics to support how are we doing against that. So what we see in here is a combination of process activity and outcome measures. So I think that is probably my last one, is it? Yeah. Yep. So thank you very much for your, your interest and attention. Um, again, watch what this group is doing, because I think we're heading in a very interesting direction of trying to bring together where the world is going, which is being represented very much by the regulatory areas, although that's a bit of a lagging uh, area in some cases, and what's actually going on in organizations. So I think... Uh, this is a great group to work with and uh, sort of watch this space. Thanks very much, uh, Zahid, and thank you, group. Thank you, Nick, for sharing the overall st structure of the standard. And uh, one other thing, uh, you talked about the culture. Definitely, it's a great element. And uh, this is something that really excites me to work with the members of this group that everybody walks the talk. I read your book, uh, Cost of Poor Culture, in which you you know, measure the actually opportunity cost of uh, not taking care of the culture, how it translates into the business implications. That's a wonderful piece uh, and uh, great work. Thank okay. you, Zoe. Uh, with this, we move to our next uh, speaker, uh, Heather uh, Whiteman. Uh, Heather uh, Whiteman is an expert in people analytics, talent transformation, and the future of work. Uh, she has a PhD in the human capital management and master in industrial organization psychology and a data science certification. Heather is an associate teaching professor of people analytics and data design and delivery courses at the University of Washington Information School and a professional faculty member at the University of California, Berkeley. Heather is a Fulbright scholar and a board advisor to the organization, a member of the international uh, organization for standardization, technical advisory group, TC260. He was previously the vice president, the global head of people strategy, analytics, and digital learning, HR operation and technology, the journal electric, digital. She has led organization through hyper growth, digital transformation, merger acquisition, and restructuring with the use of advanced data informed talent management techniques. Other passion and research focus lies in helping individuals and organizations prepare for the future of work, digital transformation, and enabling the future uh, driven by fair data and people analytics insights for the good. Her research focuses on the social justice implications of quantifying people in the world of work. And Heather, once again, for being awake at the, uh, during the midnight hours and being with us today, over to you. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Well, it is the summertime here in uh, Seattle, Washington, so the sun is going to come up soon and I have coffee, but hi everyone. Happy that you're here. Um, my friend Jeff Higgins earlier likes to introduce himself as a recovering CFO, and so while I don't normally do this, I think today I will introduce myself as a recovering uh, HR executive. So in my past career, I was an executive in the HR function. I am now a professor. But I, I bring up my past experience in the HR function because I really wanted to talk today about how beneficial these human capital reporting standards can be for directors, for company secretaries, for chief human resource officers, and for really anyone in the HR function. And I really had 11 points that I'd like to make, so one slide, but a lot of different things. Many of these connect with things that others have said today. But I wanted to call out, you know, first and foremost, uh, I believe in people data. I believe in the power of data for people, not just about people. But I do think that if we all agree that people are one of the most important assets of an organization, as many people have already said today, that we really need to understand it clearly. And we need to be able to show that value as best as possible. Today, organizations are not great at doing that. 
And I don't think it's because they disagree that there's a, a lack of value or because they don't want to do it. I think it's because it can be difficult to measure people. Uh, people are a difficult, squishy, intangible thing. However, the process gets easier when you have common consistent standards from which to build on. And so by starting with a common set of reporting standards, we can all get to a, an easier, more enhanced baseline and then also more enhanced, advanced ways of using it. So I believe that when we can pick up a common framework like ISO 30414, we can get to better data collection and analysis in the future. If we can do that, we can build from that common base to be able to do some of the stuff that I know many of us, especially those in the HR function, especially those that are directors and companies are often wanting to do, which is to connect it back to things like cost and benefit and return on investment. And only once you've established a way to tie back to data can we start to do that. So having common consistent standards can help build baselines that would enable you to be able to support those kinds of cost benefits analysis. And those kinds of analyses, they are gonna be what's gonna connect you to that ability to make strategic decisions within an organization. Those strategic decisions might be internal about how to make decisions and trade-offs about where you spend your resources or your times. They might be more broad about how you play with your market strategy and where your company's going broader term or with your investments. And when you can use that kind of data about your most important asset, then you can make the smarter decisions and you can communicate about why you're making those decisions and what you're making them about with other stakeholders, whether those stakeholders are internal to your organization. You know, maybe you are an HR professional and you need to communicate to the finance team why you need to make the investments that you need to make, or maybe they're external. Maybe you are a, a company director, maybe you're in the C-suite and you need to speak with investors about why it's important that we make the kinds of investments in our organization that we need to make. By having the ability to tie back to these things, that communication gets easier and it gets tied back to this value and it gets tied back to this value about our critical asset, which is our people. Um, this The other point that I'd like to bring out is when we start having the conversation about common, consistent metrics, benefits, value, strategic decision-making, especially for those who are in the HR function, this can start to bring about a really strong sense of credibility for where we're coming from with our profession and our field. It gives us the opportunity to talk about the things that we want to push forward, the initiatives that we want to put forward on behalf of the employees and in order to make the organization better, but with a stronger sense of credibility based on the data, based on the evidence, and based on the strategic alignment from it. It's also going to come with some nice enhanced efficiency that comes with streamlined reporting. So I mentioned I'm a recovering uh, HR executive. I had uh, responsibility for the HR operations space. And if anybody has worked in that space, you will know that reporting in the HR field is challenging. Uh, there's always a confusion about what exactly is our headcount and how exactly do we compute attrition rate and, you know, what exactly does count as an incident and what is the ratio of retention versus this. All of these questions tend to be things that every organization has to sit down and define for themselves over and over and over again. And we find that organizations are wasting a lot of time trying to redefine what metrics mean, when instead there are standards like ISO 30414, where you could pick it up and you can say, oh, look, here's a definition for this metric. Why don't we just follow this one? Because it's a standard, it has consistency, and then we can have a much streamlined, much faster approach rather than spending a lot of time pulling and debating different approaches. There, and there's still room within those definitions for making adjustments as is appropriate for the needs of your organization. But I know that a lot of operational efficiency would come out of following common consistent standards along the way. And with that operational efficiency, with that credibility, 
with all of the alignment to strategic decisions, you also get this wonderful way to be able to tie out to your organizational goals. Um, so the beauty of having the experts who are involved in building ISO 30414 is that many of them were experts in talent management or organizational management or leadership positions. And so much of what you will find in the ISO standards are specifically aligned with organizational objectives in mind, and then also with talent management objective in, in mind. And so what you're gonna find is that each of the standards are specifically designed to align to organizational goals and specifically aligned to different talent management aspects. So you just saw Nick give a great example and listed out on the slides all the different areas of talent management that are covered. You know, we had um, different recruiting and uh, safety, well-being, health, all these different areas are covered there and make sure that each standard is connected along the way. And beyond just being able to be connected, you have the opportunity to use these to help prevent and proactively address things. So risk management, for example, is a huge benefit to organizations. When you track things like safety, health, and well-being, and you have common consistent practices for doing that, you can make a really big impact in how your organization is going to be successful in these areas. And you can also use these kinds of approaches for benchmarking, finding best practices with others. Um, I know that benchmarking in the people space can be quite difficult, again, because most organizations have different definitions for what they mean when they say these things. Using common consistent standards could give you the opportunity to have a consistent measure and then truly be able to measure how your organization is doing in comparison to other organizations. And then to see where there are examples of outstanding uh, practices that can then be used as exemplars and seen as best practices. The one thing that I want to end on is this one for career development. And I don't mean career development in the talent management space. You know, career development for our employees is absolutely a great thing, but I would consider that part of talent management. I mean career development for the directors, the company secretaries, the HR professionals, Having the ability to identify, define, measure, and then communicate standard common ways of thinking about the most important asset of the company, which is the people, positions you as the person with the most important information for the organization and really is an opportunity to be in a career accelerating position, to have the insights about people puts you in a position to have the insights to make the big strategic decisions for the organization. And I would encourage anyone who's in these kinds of positions to consider embracing these as an opportunity for you to be a real strategic player in your career. And just think about how much power there is in being the one who can advocate for the human capital in your organization. So I'm a huge fan of ISO 30414. I love data and I think that these standards are going to give us an amazing baseline to be able to do so much more on top of them. So appreciate everyone who's also passionate about this and I will turn it over to the next topic. Wonderful. So Heather, I think you have presented all the, the, the assortment of the benefits that it offers in a wonderful way. And I would like to mention that uh, now there's a, you know, the paradigm shift in terms of the value creation of the HR. Uh, yesterday, I was reading an article, the latest article by the Dev Aldrich, where he talks about the HR value creation model, and that is based on the stakeholder capitalism. So there's a payoff for everyone, all the stakeholders. And I think this is a, you've described everything in a very wonderful way that how the different stakeholders can benefit from this process. Okay, so uh, with this, we can move to our next speaker, uh, Suhair uh, Abu Salem. She's the Human Capital and the Communications Director for A3 and Co. Um, I hope I'm pronouncing the name of the company correctly. A strategic and a practical uh, okay, thinker, certified senior international human resource professional from HRCI, ISO 30414 lead auditor and certified international trainer, from International Association of the People and Performance Development, whilst creating a sustainable high level of human capital management to impact the business bottom line. 
provided consultation and delivered training programs based on 14 plus years of direct experience work toward the high standards and best in class practices in the different international organizations for different HR management, the people development programs at different levels in different languages, the different countries and diverse cultures. So over to you, Zahir. Thank you so much, Zahid, and uh, welcome everyone. Uh, I think most of the inputs they have already covered why ISO 3414 is becoming essential for organizations. As you could see that ISO 3414 is the only international uh, standard for human capital management and reporting worldwide. So as you could see, this in a standard is not just uh, about ticking boxes for uh, compliance. Instead, it offers uh, a strategic edge that can elevate various aspects of your business operations. So uh, first of all, one of the common challenges that faces organizations worldwide is quantifying the human resources effectively. And ISO 3404 provides a solid framework, as you could see in, in multi-inputs, for consistent measurement and comparison of human capital metrics. So this consistency is crucial for pinpointing areas of improvement across different levels of your organization, which can help your company uh, to make informed and data-driven decisions. In other words, it turns workforce data into actionable insights, paving the way for strategic planning and effective uh, execution. Also, uh, transparency is another uh, cornerstone for today's business success, and ISO 3404 plays a crucial role here. By adhering to uh, this standard, you promote a greater openness with all stakeholders, from employees to investors to regulators, uh, customers, and even to the local community as well. So this openness builds higher level of trust and confidence. And one of the standout features of ISO 3414 is its ability to integrate cross-functionally. It brings the collective knowledge, skills, and abilities across various uh, functions, whether they are from the legal, communications, the IT, HR, health and safety, investor relations, or finance. So this standard bridges these departments. In addition, in the world of operational excellence, ISO 3414 serves as a very powerful tool. So this standard helps uh, in establishing optimized workflows and processes leading to greater efficiency across the board. And adopting ISO 3414 can significantly boost your competitive edge as research shows that companies excelling in people analytics are far more likely to outper uh, outperform their peers financially, which means it can help your business stand out in the marketplace. Another critical aspect that I-3414 can help in is the compliance and risk management. Uh, which is critical for any business operation. Here, ISO 3414 supports companies in meeting human capital reporting regulations effectively, and it provides a solid framework for managing risks associated with the entire employee life cycle. And absolutely, in today's business landscape, sustainability is more important than ever. And ISO 3414, as you could see, it, it has a completability with many of the reporting frameworks, but in specific, the, uh, the requirements of ESG, and in particular, by quantifying the human capital related uh, requirements. So this alignment is not only to improve your company's sustainability credentials, but also it demonstrates a company commitment to a green, responsible, ethical and sustainable business practices. And from a financial perspective, ISO 3414 offers significant benefits. It provides investors with clear insights into your people practices and their impact on profitability and the return on investment, which can make your company more attractive to um, 
potential funding sources, especially those focused on socially responsible and sustainable investments. And that will also simplify your journey in the market expansion strategies, and it can help also to gain global acceptance for your products and services. So to wrap up, complying with ISO 34.14 is much more than compli uh, compliance exercise. It's about harnessing these requirements to drive superior business performance, to enhance customer satisfaction, and to capitalize on market opportunities. So this comprehensive approach to human capital management can really transform how your company operates and competes on a global stage. Thank you so much. And I hope this uh, overview of ISO 3414 has provided valuable insights into the strategic benefits of ISO 3414. Thank you. Super. So thank you so much for uh, reinforcing the concept uh, that people management is an intangible aspect, but uh, intangible does not mean immeasurable. Everything is measurable and it can be linked to the organizational outcomes. Okay, uh, with this, uh, we move to our next speaker, uh, Shunsuke Hosaka-san. He's the founder and CEO of the HC Produce Incorporation Japan. His uh, client work involves helping organizations to develop succession planning and to introduce ISO 30414 to realize long-term growth. He has certified 14 organizations. I think so far this is highest in the world against the ISO 30414 as of June 2024. Before establishing HC Produce, Shunsuke led organization and leadership development practice group for 10 years at Dream Incubator Incorporation a Japanese management consulting firm, and helped its clients human capital management. Shunsuke received a BA in political science from Kyo University and MS in international affairs from Florida State University. He's ISO TC260 Mirror Committee uh, Secretariat of Japan and authorized ISO 30414 lead consultant. So over to you. Thank you, Zahid, for um, your introduction, and it's a great uh, honor to be here. So let me um, briefly explain about what's um, going on practically uh, in the world. And uh, as of today, um, there are 20 uh, companies uh, that have been certified against ISO 3414. Uh, five companies in Germany, and 40, 14 in Japan, and one in Korea. Um, it started from uh, 2021 um, from Deutsche Bank Group, where Hilda uh, belonged, and um, gradually increased um, over 2022 and 23. And um, as of now, it's still um, increasing. And um, I would like to explain uh, the situation in Japan because. Um, there's an um, increasing number of uh, companies interested in ISO 3414. Um, next slide, please. Um, what's happening in Japan? Uh, this is the um, number of ISO 3414 certified professionals, uh, individuals. Uh, we do um, professional certification program uh, quarterly based. And you can see the number of um, people who've been um, certified as a professional increasing rapidly. And um, there's over um, 800 now. And many of these um, professionals come from consulting firms. Um, next page, please. Um, there are about um, 50 companies um, who have become our partners and who have sent their consultants to our program. And they are joining our program because they are, their clients are interested in uh, human capital reporting and asking for them their help. So when we calculate the um, number of companies uh, who have started to introduce ISO 30.4 in Japan, uh, we estimate that it's uh, more than 500 now. So um, to the next slide, please. Um, 
um, the reason behind this uh, big reason is that um, it has become mandatory in Japan uh, for companies to uh, report human capital. As you can see in the bottom, um, last year, uh, the Japanese Financial Services Agency uh, has um, announced a new rule to make it mandatory for uh, public companies to report human capital in their securities report. So with this um, uh, regulatory um, background, uh, it, has, it has become mandatory for uh, organizations to uh, report human capital. Uh, next page, please. Um, but um, those companies don't know how to um, report human capital. But um, so ISO 3414 uh, gives a kind of uh, guidance to them uh, what to do and how to report. So this is the reason um, why Japanese uh, companies are now started to uh, introduce ISO 3414. And I will also um, briefly explain how should we write um, human capital reports? Um, next slide, please. Um, many of the ISO 3414 certified uh, organizations um, have issued human capital reports. And this is um, a snapshot of the um, reports from each organization. And um, it doesn't have to be um, human capital reports. Some uh, organizations uh, do it through uh, IR report or annual reports. So uh, next slide, please. Um, here are the uh, five points um, for uh, writing human capital report. So first thing is that um, there's no right answer for uh, writing a human capital report. Uh, ISO 3.4 doesn't specify uh, how to report that. Uh, it could be uh, integrated report, or it can be a uh, human capture report, or ESG report, or just uh, put it on a web page. So you can do it anyway. And the second point is that um, think of who you want to communicate with. Um, our colleague has um, uh, presented about the importance of, of stakeholder communication and especially um, investor could be the uh, primary target but it's not only uh, investors it could be uh, donors or customers or even job seekers uh, in Japan many companies are starting to report human capital to attract talent because uh, in Japan there's uh, decreasing um, number of um, workforce and um, some companies do it to attract their own workers uh, their employees so um, it is important to uh, think of who you want to uh, convey your message and third point is um, data is of course critical but um, narrative explanation is uh, important as well because um, data alone does not um, uh, tell the meaning of the uh, of the number without uh, the context. So, um, for example, um, a turnover rate for three percent for an organization could be good or bad for a company who sets a KPI for ten percent. Three percent is too low, but uh, for a company who sets a KPI for one percent turnover. 3% uh, is too high. So um, without the um, context or uh, KPI or some explanation, um, the number itself does not um, explain enough. And the fourth point is um, it is very important to show the uh, link between business strategy and HR strategy. It's um, close to uh, narrative explanation, but um, especially investors uh, they want to see the relationship or um, co-relationship between the uh, human capital uh, metrics and the possibility of um, future growth of that organization. So um, 
it is very important that the um, data shown, uh, human capital data uh, reported, is related to the uh, business strategy of the organization. And the last point is that um, ISO 30.4 metrics uh, are not the only metrics. So um, some organizations have their own metrics and some industry could have their own metrics. So um, using ISO 30.4, um, you can also um, report your own metrics. So uh, we always recommend to use uh, ISO 30.4 as a tool for uh, reporting. Uh, so uh, with this, um, I'll uh, finish my presentation. Uh, thanks for uh, your attention. Back to you, Zahid. Okay, super. Uh, so thank you so much for sharing us uh, with us the overall condensed version of the, uh, you know, what all is happening in your market and uh, uh, what to keep in mind while writing a report. And also, uh, we appreciate your effective role modeling, modeling in terms of uh, influencing and motivating all the stakeholders for their effective engagement with the ISO 30414. Okay, so our uh, now next speaker is uh, uh, Dr. Kyungsu uh, Shin, and uh, he's the founder of the SGI, Sustainable Development Growth Institute, which is a very famous company focused on the leadership training and the organization culture consulting in the CEO, uh, South Korea. He's a member of the Leadership Development Committee in the South Korea, which is a non-government organization to study and report uh, what the Korean CEO leadership has to be. Uh, furthermore, he is an HR advisor of the InnoBiz uh, Association in the South Korea. His final goal is uh, going to support the sustainability of the Korean company through human capital enforcement. Uh, to make his goal come true, he is now developing himself to promote ISO 30414 to the Korean companies. He's the first mover called an authorized consultant of ISO 30414 in the uh, South Korea. So over to you, Shen. Thank you, Zahid. Uh, before, sh before showing it my presentation file, I'd, I'd like to say that I'm very impressed by the speech of uh, 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 Osaka Shinsuke of uh, the kind of ambience of the situation of Japanese, the current spreading out of the ISO 3 of one. Anyway, I like to say my uh, my presentation file. Uh, I'm very happy to be able to talk about the Korean situation regarding uh, 3 of one, ISO 3 of one four. Uh, there are main uh, three main topics to announce today. First, the background of ISO 3 of one four be introduced in Korea. Second. Domestic spread situation of 30414 and third, the situation of uh, ISO 30414 certification. Uh, firstly, when it comes to ISO 30414 itself, uh, 30414 was first introduced in South Korea in December 2022 after I attended the T260 general meeting held in Berlin, Germany in 2022. I wrote an article related to the HR global standards discussed there, and I sent it to the Hangyong, the number one economy newspaper in South Korea. The related content was about the global trend and the necessity of ISO 30414. Surprisingly, several companies contacted me uh, after reading this article and expressed their interest in. And I constantly publish related articles in HR magazine and the other newspaper. As their articles are posted online, people seem to be gaining interest. Uh, Zahid, uh, second slide. Next slide. Second one is the domestic spread situation of 3014. After issuing a newspaper article, many companies gave me uh, uh, their interesting about uh, ISO 3014. And I decided to open consultant course, just like uh, Japan. Five people, at the first time, five people in charge of HR department enrolled this consultant course. The time was March 2023, uh, last year. And in September, I opened a second course. And at this time, 20 people registered. And this year, 2024, this year, March, 
16 people completed a course and received a consultant certification. That means that the number of receiving consultant certification of ISO 3144 are 40 people. However, it can be said that the purpose of taking a certification course is a strong nature of studying to find out what the ISO 3414 is. FYI, the ISO 3414 consultant course that I am conducting is the only course about the 3414 in South Korea. Uh, Zahid, next slide, please. Third one is the situation of uh, ISO 3414 certification. Uh, finally, uh, the first company in South Korea to receive ISO 3414 certification was born in May uh, this year. I'm very happy. The above company is in the pharmaceutical uh, field and is name of Tonga Social Holdings. In South Korea, it is a company with a very high reputation as one of the top 10 companies in the pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical industry. The certification audit was conducted by uh, our friend Jeff, a CEO of HCMI, and I also did my best to help Jeff finish ISO 3414 audit of our Tong A. The time I spent with Jeff was very enjoyable. Uh, it was a very happy time. And I, although it was hard work, it was very happy to become the Tonga to be certified. Uh, currently, there are two companies in South Korea preparing uh, for receiving ISO 3414 certification. I can't announce the name of the company because I haven't received the official application of the certification yet. But there are very uh, famous companies. Above things, the uh, current situation about ISO 3414 in South Korea, although they are still far away from global trend and below status of our neighbor country, Japan, Shinsuke, uh, I will do my best to so that more companies in Korea can receive ISO 3414 certification. Thank you very much, my colleagues. Excellent. Yeah, and I finish my before I finish my presentation. I uh, wanna give my honor to uh, Salon, uh, our best colleague, because I'm reading a book. I got uh, so many, so much of inspiration about the human capital uh, due to our colleagues Salon. Thank you, Salon. Super. That's all. Thank you very much, my colleagues. So, um, as you mentioned, that uh, I think uh, you've been able to successfully implemented this standard uh, for the individuals and also one of the organizations. So uh, this uh, brings us to an understanding that HR itself, with a practitioner, consultant, researcher, academician, uh, this is one of the key stakeholders of this process. And uh, you can add a lot of value to the industry and also, you know, it has, I think, the strong uh, economic prospects for the individuals as well. Thank you. Uh, that's why I said the sun never sets on this group. It reminds me to a, uh, you know, the time about the time frame. Uh, I think 10th, 11 November in Washington D.C. when the ISO TC 260 was created. I was one of them, and there were four countries in the uh, working group HR matrix: uh, U.S., Germany, France, uh, Netherlands, and Pakistan itself. And by now, you can see how this uh, tide is rising, and how more and more people are getting involved with the standards. Okay, so uh, next is I would like to have uh, you know, uh, some views about the different aspects of the 30414, uh, particularly from the individual capability point of view. I'll skip my introduction. I can only say that I'm passionate for this uh, 30414 and particularly human capital analytics right from the outset. I created my company on the philosophy of uh, this linking, you know, the people matrix with the organization outcomes. And that's why I called it the HR matrix, the name of the company. And uh, uh, the important thing is that while we offer this, uh, you know, this standard as a, uh, as a document uh, and a comprehensive uh, framework to the industry, you know, what are the principles that we follow? In that context, I think uh, we have, uh, uh, we uh, must be aware that for us, the guiding principle is already in the form of the ISO 17024, uh, which provides some guidelines for the you know, bodies operating the certification of the persons. Because 
as uh, one of the speaker mentioned that this is a guideline standard it's not a requirement standard but still we need to have certain principles in mind what are those principles that we keep in mind while offering certification of the individuals who belong to various organizations and the people are in the different parts of the countries uh, things like the competence uh, we make sure that the people that uh, you know whosoever is involved in teaching uh, the ISO 30414 uh, uh, has the competency because the ISO 30414 in the first instance is not that comprehensive that it covers every aspect, all the descriptors, all the kind of 100% uh, uh, formulas, those are not there in the standard, but, uh, uh, you know, by doing a, a kind of research uh, with the different uh, established bodies around the world, we are able to get, I think, the relevant information that can put us in a very good position to uh, you know, uh, uh, improve the quality of the understanding. The second important aspect is that while we conduct the certification of this ISO 30414, we ensure impartiality. So a kind of firewall between the assessment and the teaching uh, so that uh, there's no uh, short circuit over there. So the group which is involved with teaching of the ISO 30414 is not involved in the assessment or the evaluation. And our goal is to ensure currency of the expertise uh, through the process of recertification, because uh, this is an evolution. Now, very soon you would be, uh, hopefully, uh, maybe uh, during this year or maybe sometime later, uh, you come across the next version of ISO 30414. And there are so many things which are happening around ISO 30414, like the Jeff talked about the, some of the emerging standards. So how you can draw the better connections and how you can stay current with the, the emerging concept that we also promote uh, through our teaching. And for that matter, we follow a certain process of certifications like the ethical undertaking, just to make sure that the people represent what they're supposed to represent and there's no misrepresentation on this. So there's a proper disclosure of in terms of the content, the structures, uh, the status of the standards, uh, to, uh, the uh, kind of different organization structures on the with the different stand the standards are applicable which is a small medium or the large organization and the process that we follow for the you know offering the trainings and also the assessments and lastly as I said the in just to ensure the currency of the expertise we have a defined mechanism for the recertification so on the basis of this whole structure we are able to come up with a program that has a I think a win-win for everyone with as a practitioner as a consultant as an active academician you can benefit from it but while making sure there's no conflict of interest and that means that if you're acting as a consultant with a company you're not supposed to be an auditor with that company so this this thing this is the key element in the entire process and using the same framework fortunately we can say that uh, we've been able to develop i think over 800 people so far around the world I think, uh, and uh, we also have our partners in Japan and uh, Shunsuki Osaka has already mentioned that this is the highest number so far, I think made, uh, mainly in the Japanese market. And the people that come not only from, uh, they, they belong to different territories, the different regions. So there's a good mix of the people almost in every part of the world now uh, within our homeland and outside. So they represent uh, the HR, uh, the overall, uh, the uh, they are in a position to offer the uh, uh, not only consulting and training, but build the uh, organization in whatever way the organization deems appropriate. The ISO 30414 has already a defined structures that is in the form of the I think the overall 11 different clusters, the 58 metrics. And uh, those metrics are the, uh, basically the applicability of those metrics. It depends upon the structure of the organization. The organizations uh, could be, a, if it is a large organization, all 58 metrics are applicable internally. But for the external reporting, only 23 are valid. If it's a small and a medium organization, there are 32 metrics which are applicable. And if it's a, for the external reporting, only the 10 metrics are applicable. So I think this was all about uh, the overall, uh, you know, building capacity of the overall industry uh, from the professional certification point of view. So with this, I would like to uh, move to our next speaker, uh, Dr. Heiko, uh, one of our, uh, you know, key practitioner who, who, has, who has been very instrumental in building the capacity of the uh, overall market. I think he was the first certifier on the earth. And uh, 
uh, of the uh, by uh, certifying a company, if I remember correctly, DWS Asset Management. So Heiko is a board member and the senior partner with the 4C Group uh, Germany. And uh, this uh, management consultancy, he studied business administration uh, and engineering at the University of Karlsruhe and did a doctoral degree at the University of Berlin. And uh, with the 4C Group, Heiko is responsible for the 4C HR management practices, uh, supporting company all over the globe in HR management related projects. He joined ISO and DIN in 2016 and is one of the content authors of the Human Capital Reporting Guidelines, ISO 30414, which was established in 2018. He supports organization in implementing ISO 30414 and also offers certification services for the company in and in the ISO context. Heiko is a board member of the Goenger Chris, a think tank for people in the, responsible for HR position, the business and the science, who act as a thought leaders and drive initiative for sustainable employment. So Heiko, over to you. Thanks, Said. Uh, can you hear me, by the way? Very well. Right, wonderful. So thanks for having me, Said. Uh, it's really it's really an honor to be part of this uh, group and to have the opportunity to talk to you guys. And well, hello, everyone. Um, I'd like to talk uh, to you about um, two topics. So first of all, which organizations provide certifications at all? And on the next slide, um, I'll talk to you about how a certification process uh, could possibly look like. So let's start with the organizations that provide certifications. So very important for you to know is that these are only examples and i'm completely sure that i forgot some um, organizations or companies that provide certifications so sorry for that but at least these are some um, organizations that we as a group are aware of um, that they uh, provide certification services in the context of isis 3414 because um a lot of these um, companies have um, senior executives that are part of our group, Human Capital Impact. So let's start with um, HC Produce in Japan, our esteemed member, um, Shunsuke Hosaka-san. Um, he's the founder and CEO of HC Produce. Um, he offers um, certifications um, in Asia, especially for companies, first of all, but um, also for individuals. Um, then for C Group, my own company, we offer certifications for companies only. We are a management consultancy and um, with a strong human um, resource management um, practice. And uh, we offer certifications for companies only, not for individuals. And um, then we also have certainly Zahid uh, HR Metrics. So uh, Zahid is CEO, CEO of HR Metrics. And he just informed us that he had uh, hundreds of individuals certified against ISO 3414. Um, he's headquartered in Pakistan. Um, and then we have um, HCMI, Human Capital Management Institute, um, with Jeff Higgins. Um, is the founder, also an esteemed member of our group. He offers also certifications for companies headquartered in the USA, as far as I know, in Los Angeles. And then there's also the Human Resource Standards Institute. A lot of you guys probably have heard of uh, this institute. Um, they offer certifications for companies, especially um, in the area of ISO 3414 and also ISO 3415. So these are only some examples um, of companies that provide certification services. Um, as I already said, this uh, there I, we probably missed one or the other company that is also providing certification services. Then please uh, to the next slide, Zahid. Thanks. Um, so and now I want to talk to you about how an organization can get certified. So the first step should certainly be to implement ISO 3414 into the human capital reporting of the specific um, organization. So certainly, first of all, you have to purchase the standard. You can purchase it directly at the ISO homepage. Just Google ISO 3414, and then you'll find directly the landing page where you can um, purchase uh, the standard, and then certainly read it, understand it, and implement it 
um, within your own human capsule reporting. Shunsuke Hosaka just uh, told us how to put together a decent um, human capsule report. So do, is, do this at the first step. And then if you implemented um, ISO 3414 within your human capsule reporting, then the next step can certainly be the certification. So um, apply um, um, at a certification body to get certificate, um, certificated and mandate the certification body to perform a certification um, assessment. And then um, the certification organization will do this um, assessment. And if this will be um, successful, you certainly get a certificate and an assessment report by the certification organization, perhaps by one of those um, that I mentioned before um, on the previous slide. And then I think step three, from my understanding, is the most important step because a certification is nothing if you do not do something with it. You know, if you do not use and and um, um, do something um, of value with the transparency that you produced by implementing ISO 3414 within your human capital reporting. So, and, and therefore step three for me is the most important step. Uh, and this is what I call benefits collection. Um, you certainly can, um, you know, use this certification in order to uh, do marketing around it and communication internally, externally, PR campaigns and things like that. With this, you certainly can further position um, your HR function, for example, or even your company um, in general, um, that um, you're further professionalizing your um, HR management framework within your company. But what you can also do is you can do benchmarking um, for these KPIs with other companies that have been certified, because now you have a higher level of comparability, you know. Um, it's not like, um, you know, um, comparing apples with bananas. Now it's rather like comparing green apples to red apples, for example. So the comparability is much higher because you can rely on if an other company that you're benchmarking with is also certified against 3414, then you can be sure that the KPIs that you are benchmarking are, you know, calculated very similar similar to the calculation that you used. So do benchmarking, try to understand um, how, where, where you are and how you can um, get better. And then what I call active management of disclosed KPIs, not only providing transparency, not only um, disclosing the KPIs, but also start to actively manage these KPIs and, um, you know, in order to increase your performance within these KPIs and then automatically within your workforce and within your company. So this is in a nutshell, um, our um, understanding of the certification process. Um, thanks for your interest. Thanks for your attention. And again, please follow us, our group Human Capital Impact on LinkedIn. And if you have any questions uh, regarding this topic, please do not hesitate to contact one of us or me directly. And then over to you, back to you, Zahid. Thanks. All right. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Heiko, for putting this information together. I think this is a key question. One of the key questions that the people ask, how to get certified, and most importantly, how to have access to the authentic and the reliable organizations which are truly compliant of the standards in the true letter and the spirit. And, uh, okay. So uh, we, just, we now move our, to our last speaker. Uh, and uh, he's Brad Boyson. Uh, he's the co-founder and CEO of the HR Learning, a boutique uh, capital consultancy based in Dubai, UAE. Mr. Boyson has been an active ISO HR standards member since project inception, Washington, D.C. 2011. He's currently convener, ISO 30414 Human Capital Reporting and the Vice Chair of the Standards Canada Council. Mirror Committee for the ISO TC260. A frequent international keynote speaker, his contribution to the pro uh, professional body of the HR knowledge include publishing a chapter on the global HR economics as, a, as well as co-authoring three different professional study guides. Preceded by five years as an exam item writer for HRCI GPHR certifications, his diverse global practitioner experience includes head of the HR operations role for Mitsubishi Corporation, 
uh, Vancouver, Canada, Royal Caribbean International, Miami, USA, and Imar, Dubai, UAE. During his practitioner career, he worked on the different inhabited continent, coupled with the overseeing workforce diversity and access in excess of the 80 different nationalities. And you can talk about now what's coming ahead. So over to you, Brad. Thank you, Zai. Just confirming you can hear me? Very well. Wonderful. Well, I want to thank all of those people watching live who've uh, um, gone through all of the excellent speakers so far. As Zahid mentioned, my um, section, I don't have any slides to present, and I'll explain that shortly, is on version two of the standards. So part of the reason I don't have slides is that it's still a work in progress, and there's nothing conclusive until the standard is actually the version two of the standard is actually published. But what I wanted to talk about a bit today is just sort of the direction to which the technical committee is going without getting into any specifics. And as you can imagine, when we reopened the um, working group for 30414, uh, our first plan of action was to sort of study the gap, do a gap analysis in terms of what had changed since the original publication in 2018 and what were the market needs um, uh, five years later. And as you can imagine, in, in any field, a lot of things change in a period of five years. When the original 30414 was published, there was, it was the only, um, entity and standard in this human capital dedicated space. Since that time, several significant global entities have entered into the human capital standards and regulation space. And part of our mandate as a working group is to enhance version one, and I emphasize the word enhance, but also try to look for areas of alignment with these other international standards. So ISO has that unique position of being international in every sense of the word, in terms of its working groups, in terms of its mandate. And so I just wanted to list some of the sort of areas that we deemed early on in this revision that were areas for improvement and keeping in mind the consistency with the general doctrine of ISO of continual improvement. So if you think of the standard itself in sort of two buckets, you know, you have the metrics area of the of it, but it is a reporting standard as well. And it's not one or the other, it's a combination of both. So in terms of our gap analysis, the first thing that we came up with as an area for improvement was more direction, if you will, in terms of guidance. As a few of our speakers have mentioned before, this is not a requirement standard, it is a guidance standard. And so what were some of the areas that we felt we could enhance on? Um, one of them was, as other speakers have mentioned, is more of an alignment with sustainability. Uh, back in 2018, there were, were entities and discussions sort of as to framing the concept of sustainability. Some people equate it with ESG. And, and since that time, we felt it was important to be more explicit in terms of the standards alignment with sustainability. The second one that a few people have mentioned throughout this presentation is materiality. Now, I'm not going to do a deep dive into materiality. It is a very multifaceted topic. But as some of our speakers have mentioned, the concept of relevant, impactful information related to human capital was an area that we felt we could enhance in the guidance as well. One of the areas that, and again, I, I think it was uh, Shinsuke-san who mentioned this, is that version one of the standard doesn't give explicit directions on how to prepare a report on, on human capital reporting. And it was felt that we could be more explicit in that areas as well. Without sort of giving a template per se, there has been an alignment with different entities um, in the global standard space to converge on a common framework for disclosure. So as part of our um, update of the standard, we're going to be a bit more explicit on how to present a human capital report. Um, one of the areas that probably you would anticipate is that did we miss anything 
in version one? Were there any metrics that should have been included? Were there metrics that perhaps were a bit redundant or overemphasized? So again, it's a work in progress. I, I, I can't be explicit on what the outcome of that will be, but I just wanted to update everyone as that's part of the mandate of the working group is to find where there might have been some metrics that could be added to be more comprehensive, but also in terms of the efficiency of the standard itself, where there might be some redundancy of metrics, where we might do some consolidation. That's really sort of the high level overview that I wanted to share with everyone. If I'm sure there would be questions as to when the version two will be coming out. And again, this doesn't have a specific answer. It's based on the speed at which the working group goes through the various stages of the ISO development process for standards. As others have mentioned, we've just entered into the draft international stage of this, which is sort of just over halfway, if you will, that's sort of a heuristic, don't take it literally, of the development of the standard. But I think it's fair comment to say that we're targeting having this enter into the public domain as a published document, fair comment in terms of probably Q1 of 2025. So I'm going to leave it there. Uh, I'm going to pass it back to Zahid for any follow-up. And I'm not sure if we're going to do questions or anything, Zahid, but I leave it to you. Thank you so much. Uh, so with this, uh, uh, all the speakers, uh, we are done uh, with their talks. And now we, I think uh, all the time is up. We can still have some time for the question or the comments that anybody may like to have. And then we can, uh, would like to close this uh, webinar. So anyone with any questions or comments, feel free to type in the chat box, or if you wish to speak, uh, that would be preferred. Anyone from, from within the speakers or the participants, feel free to get involved. David Simmons from HCM Metrics in UK. Thank you everybody for a wonderful overview of all that's been happening in the last few years. Um, it's good to see some marketing uh, in this area and I commend everybody in pushing forward in this very important topic. Thanks for your remarks, David Simmons. Okay. Thank you, Nick, for sharing your email ID. All right. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, here is the website of the HCM uh, Human Capital Impact Global Expert Network. Uh, for more resources, uh, we have uh, the information regarding the company that are certified uh, hopefully, uh, uh, we'll have more information in times to come. We will also going to upload the webinar, I think, in the next uh, two days. So feel free to get in touch. We also have a page on the LinkedIn. And uh, with this, uh, if you have any, don't have any further questions or comments, we will be uh, closing this uh, session. Or oh, Helga, would you like to have any final remarks over to you? I do have a very quick comment. Mm -hmm. I want to thank you, Sahit. This has been wonderful. Uh, great experience. Um, a lot of time went into that in getting this thing organized. But I also want to thank all of you uh, participants who spent all the time with us. Two hours in a webinar is a lot of work, a lot of attention. This was fantastic. And certainly to all of my partners, you know, uh, I see them now on the screen. Uh, it's very touching and very, very um, impressive um, what has happened today. And, um, and the good thing is it's being taped. Um, and the good thing is for all participants, you can reach out to any one of us in the Human Capital Impact Network and beyond of that for individual conversations um, that you might have uh, took, taken notes about. So, Saeed, thank you to you and your team. Pleasure and happy to connect and serve the group. Uh, so, uh, thank you everyone for connecting from the different parts of the world in the different time zone and hoping to have more such dialogue in the future because this is a process and we'd like to, you know, we are open to learn from each other. Thank you once again. All the best. Take care of yourself. Bye. Thanks, Hilga. Sadi, you can close the webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.